Without further ado, I would love to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Matt Housley. Matt is the Chief Technology Officer at Tenery Data, where he assists clients with data strategy in the cloud. He is also the co-author of O'Reilly's best-selling book, Fundamentals of Data Engineering. Thank you so much for joining us today, Matt. So uh, the title of my talk is How to Feel, Fail with Real-Time Analytics, which uh, seems very germane for this audience. So uh, this is me. I have a PhD in math, which I hardly use anymore, except to occasionally read papers about uh, low-rank matrix transformations and, and uh, adaption and such in large language models. Uh, but it, it does help in the domain of understanding problem solving in technology. So that's where probably most of the transfer has happened. And uh, I've worked in consulting for a couple of years uh, with my business partner, Joe Reese. And uh, we also wrote a book called Fundamentals of Data Engineering, which is kind of a convergence of uh, both technology and, and solving business problems with data engineering. And so I think that's what a lot of this conference is about. You're going to hear about lots of exciting technology developments. But all of those target interesting things that we can do with data in real time or in batch or some combination of the two. Um, as you may have guessed from the talk title, this talk will be slightly facetious. And so some of the opinions expressed here may not exp match the opinions of the conference organizers or even my own opinions. So let's jump into the material here. Um, I actually, in spite of other talks I've given and things I talk about, I, I hate all real-time data. I think we should keep everything batch. It's much simpler to do things in the simpler way. Uh, so I'm going to give you six tips for sabotaging real-time data initiatives. And we'll start with this first one. And the first one is boil the ocean. And here's the idea. Boil the ocean means take all of your data and try to cram it into real-time pipelines. And this often sounds like a great idea. These initiatives can originate in many different places within a company. Um, often it's an engineering team lead or a VP who's responsible for execution and gets very excited about using tools like Apache Kafka to pipeline data. Or it could be a CTO or CEO who reads a Gartner report about trends in real-time data and decides to cram everything into this type of system. And Often you'll have a nice diagram like this and without a lot of detail and on the left you'll have a bunch of data sources like Google Ads and Facebook and pass it into PubSub and then in, like magic, pass it into Apache Beam and exciting things will happen on the other side. And to really make an initiative fail this way, it's good to focus on sources that are inherently not real time, like partner sources where you can grab reports once a day and cram those into a pipeline. Or if you're dealing with native real-time sources, make sure that you don't do anything interesting with them. Just process them, pass them through these pipelines, and then don't do anything that shows the benefit from real-time analytics. OK, after the Boil the Ocean initiative, what comes next? Does anyone know what this is? It's a Rube Goldberg machine. OK, so the next thing we can do to try to make real-time data initiatives fail is build Rube Goldberg machines. And this is something that can happen in software anyway, right? We can build arbitrarily complex systems. And the important thing with Rube Goldberg machines, not only do we want them to be complex and expensive, but we want to make sure that they don't do anything particularly interesting. And so this is closely related to the first idea of boiling the ocean, trying to cram all your data into real-time pipelines without actually having a clear purpose for doing so. And so for example, suppose I have a simple batch pipeline that is inherently a batch processor. And in this case, I'm uh, generating recommender scores in BigQuery, just using some simple model training. And then I export that in my pipeline to cloud storage. And then I pass that over to a Postgres database so that I can score things in real time just by pulling data out of that database. So my application for, can read from the Postgres database, pull those scores. But remember, behind the scenes, this is all a batch process. And so if I want to turn this into a Rube Goldberg machine without a lot of value, uh, let's make it a little more complicated. Let's go BigQuery, then Cloud Storage, then let's break that up into events and pass it into Pulsar, and then pass it in to uh, Postgres. And even though real-time systems can be really fast, they can also be really slow. If you, they, you can develop back pressure, you can dump too much data in at once, you can make them very expensive by doing things like having a bunch of Pulsar nodes that just handle one job, and they get busy for 30 minutes a day. 
and then they sit idle the rest of the time. And so we can take a job that would normally run for four minutes and make it run for 30 minutes instead and make it very expensive. OK, next thing, don't budget for complexity. So uh, I was actually having this conversation with Vince Gonzalez yesterday. He's somewhere in the audience here, I think. And that is inherently, real-time systems can be complicated. And that's something we always have to take into account. Um, and when I think about complexity, I think most of all about the human management of complexity. So in other words, how much of my time is an initiative going to take? Um, how much time is it going to take me to manage code deploys, to manage updates, to manage security updates, to manage bugs? What's the operational complexity? Um, what's the attention complexity? How often does a particular initiative pull my attention w away from other things that I care about? Uh, what about the sort of irritation complexity? So for example, if I have Zookeeper nodes that go down at 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning and someone has to get called in to fix those, that's a big source of irritation. That's a big source of complexity. And the question is, are we budgeting appropriately for that, given the size of our team? Um, one thing I've seen happen a number of times at small startups is that a very smart young developer, straight out of college, uh, starts experimenting with Apache Kafka, which is great. And they spin it up on their MacBook. And then they start experimenting with uh, Apache Beam. And they spin that up on their MacBook. And then they decide from there to uh, run their own nodes, and so to deploy servers. And then if you want to make it a bit more complicated, you can throw in your own hardware on top of that and try managing that. And then pretty soon, the, the complexity budget gets out of control. So they have only two developers to manage this, and people start getting called in to manage systems going down over the weekend. And they have to manage a lot of updates on servers and Linux updates and software updates and such. And then, I've actually seen this before, if you want to make it even more complicated and a high risk, park your server rack next to some tanks of liquid nitrogen at a biotech startup. I was, I'm not aware of actual, any actual spill. They eventually ripped this out and went to a cloud setup instead. But the point is that all of this complexity that comes with real time needs to be budget, budgeted if you're going to, well, don't budget for it if you want your initiatives to fail. If you want them to succeed, obviously, then think in different terms. Think about how much complexity you can handle in your systems. OK. This is very much consultant speak, business value. What is business value exactly? Um, there's a very famous concurring Supreme Court opinion by a justice named Potter Stewart. And he uses this famous idea, you know it when you see it. And I won't go into that uh, opinion much more, but that's, it's kind of the same way with business value. Um, if, you want your, if you want to make sure that you sabotage a real-time data initiative, make sure that you ignore this. What are some examples of business value? Well, they're the very obvious ones tied directly to the bottom line. So for example, we generate scores or bids for ads. But there are a lot of indirect versions of business value. And often, often it's developers who can identify these because they're familiar with the company's data. They often get familiar with things like customer frustrations. And business value can be things like improving the customer experience. So they want to come back and do more business with your company. So for example, I hate it when my bag gets lost because I'm, checking, I'm carrying on camera equipment and I've got to check a bag. Um, I especially hate it when my bag gets lost twice on the way to Europe and then coming back to Europe. Uh, it's kind of understandable, though, when there are strikes going on and your bag can't make it through customs when you're connecting. But what's frustrating on top of that is not where, knowing where your bag is and having to wait at the carousel not knowing if it's going to come through or not. And actually, the airlines have sort of gotten good at certain parts of real-time data. Uh, they will send you a notification when your bag is loaded onto the plane. But what would be additional business value from my perspective? Uh, if you could tell me when my bag did not make the plane and give me the bad news early so I could start planning, that would actually be fantastic. But as much as I'm frustrated by this experience, I hate real-time analytics even more. So definitely don't do this kind of thing. Don't improve the customer experience. Don't, don't create, in a sense, I wouldn't call this delight, but just don't, don't ease the pain of being a customer for your company if you want your real-time analytics initiatives to fail. OK, what is this one? What do I mean by 
real-time native capabilities. Um, there's a flavor of real-time, which is not really real-time. It's still useful. And that is, you can do things like change data capture just to synchronize multiple databases. And this allows you to do things like batch-oriented queries on top of data that's very up-to-date. That's useful. And at this point, you know, your, your real-time initiative has gone fairly far. But if you want to block it from being even more successful, you want to prevent things like this, using the more dynamic capabilities of a real-time framework, where instead of simply running queries on data that's synchronized, you emit events and alerts automatically. And so, of course, that's a lot of what this conference is about, is these kinds of capabilities. OK, and this is a big one. So if you get to this point, your initiatives have really succeeded, and you have a very serious problem. But don't worry. This is kind of a Hail Mary, but it's often very, very effective. And this is what it comes down to. Uh, Real-time systems are so useful that they often become entangled in the fabric of the application itself. And by that, I mean that they get into critical paths in an application. Uh, so for example, you can have real-time analytics get entangled into a payment processing system. You can have real-time analytics get integrated into an employee scheduling system. And there, there's a good reason why we call message buses, alternatively, enterprise middleware, because they can function right at the heart of an application. And so as you're working on real-time initiatives with streaming buses, this can happen. Startups can start out treating a real-time system, say PubSub with Beam or Kafka or Pulsar, just as a nice to have, and then pretty soon that event stream is being passed into mission critical systems. And if you want to make sure that your real time initiative really goes down in flames, don't adjust your SLA when that happens. Or I think I said service level objective. So that means don't adjust the expected uptime. Don't, expect, don't adjust the recovery state objective. In other words, don't ensure that your data is going to be recoverable if the system goes down. And don't ensure that you're going to be able, able to recover within a reasonable amount of time. And if you do that, in other words, if you stop that last step of getting to appropriate mission critical level of availability and reliability and recovery state, then you can easily end up with a situation like this. And I think we're, many of us are aware, are aware of things like this that have happened because these systems are so incredibly useful and valuable. And so again, that's my advice. If you want your real-time initiatives to fail, boil the ocean, build Rube Goldberg machines, don't budget for complexity, ignore business value, don't use real-time native capabilities, and don't set appropriate service level objectives. And I'll stop there.